the final prophet of God, said to be Muhammad of Islam. This is from Wikipedia. This the information I'm about to give you on uh, the, the the founder of Islam, Muhammad Mustafa, and then I had several comments to make on all of it. When Muhammad was 40 years old, he was commanded by God through his angel Gabriel to declare his oneness. And of course, God as one began with the Jewish people and the Hebrew Bible. To the idolaters of the whole world, and to deliver the message of peace to the embattled humanity. In response to this command from heaven, Muhammad launched the momentous program called Islam, which was to change the destiny of mankind forever. He was in Hira when one day the archangel Gabriel appeared before him and brought to him the tidings that God had chosen him to be his last messenger to this world and had imposed upon him the duty of leading mankind out of the welter of sin and ignorance into the light of guidance, truth, and knowledge to be a light to the world, which should sound familiar to the Jewish people. According to the accounts of this Shia Muhammad, Well, I'm working on this. Again, I'm just getting started on all this. Uh, and I have a computer in front of me because my cell phone is not responding correctly this morning. And the Lord wants me to get this done. And, um, Gabriel's not an angel. Clearly, they plagiarized the Hebrew Bible and put into the, their own cultural laws and norms and, and what they consider morality. And, uh, and, of course, Christianity is based around uh, a story. Just that, a story. They call it the greatest story you ever told. I agree. It's a great story. Billions of people have been deceived into believing it. Now, I can understand the people of antiquity believing it. But the people today believing it? Uh, I, I, I really don't know what to say about that. I, I don't know... I don't know how you can believe God made a human sacrifice to you and by his blood, by, by, by his stripes, we are healed. <laughs> Again, God made me watch Christian channels. And, <laughs> and then there's this one fella, I'll sell you the, the blessings of David. I said, well, God, what, what are the blessings of David? I'm thinking. And he said, there are no blessings of David. He's making it up. People believe him. They send their names in with money, and he says their name on the air, and that's what they really want. So, but there is no angel Gabriel. He only appears in the book of Daniel. He only appears in the book of Daniel, uh, who is not a prophet, and it is not a book of the prophets. And he doesn't speak with God. That's what a prophet is. And even Jesus calls him a prophet and uh, quotes him as a prophet, and he's not. Um, it's just story. I mean, come on. A bunch, of, a bunch of men standing in a kiln that's burning hotter than the sun? It's just not going to happen. <laughs> I get it. It's not going to happen. But you read the same things, the, the, the leaders of Judaism read the same kind of absolute, that can't happen. But because they like it, and they say our sages believe that, we believe it. Well, your sages lived in another time. Michael Scobat, Jews for Judaism, who also claims Isaiah 53, is the Jewish people as one man, Israel, as one man. They had gathered, been crushed by disease, and offered themselves for guilt at some time in history that I'm unfamiliar with. Because he doesn't say it's something that's going to happen. They act as though it already happened. Uh, Tubby is saying about Reese Judaism believes it happened in World War II with the Holocaust. But that was just six million. That wasn't all the Jews of the world gathered as one man in Israel. 
They didn't get along a lot. They didn't see their children. They didn't teach righteousness. Neither did Hitler if he's the one that offered them as these ram sacrifices. Because he reads an offering of oneself for guilt to literally mean, these are his words, it literally means a guilt offering. Let's go to Leviticus. Now he doesn't say let's go to Leviticus. He says it's a guilt offering, but a guilt offering is an unblemished ram for theft or destruction of holy things, debts. What that has to do with anything, I don't know. Because he's, he's an anti-missionary, he's, he's pointing this interpretation of 53 away from Isaiah 53, but they, you know, they think they're forgiven of sin. They're not worried about theft they're, <laughs> and destruction of holy things. They're not worried about that. So I don't know what he's doing except reaching, really, really reaching. I think the description of a man marred so, so, so much beyond human appearance, semblance, um, and, and all these, this, you know, plague, afflicted, that the Holocaust just grabbed him, and he just made it fit. Well, that's what the Christians do. They make Jesus fit. They can, they can argue with me on every single verse, and if you've read, uh, watched my six videos on 5376 videos, some of them were just a half an hour. But um, there's a lot to it. And I'm the only person who's ever explained it this way. Is anybody who watches it that's familiar with 53 and uh, the commentators on today, you realize nobody's read it like this. And nobody's ever connected the story of Ezekiel to it. And, you know, this atheist, pretty smart guy, but, uh, you know, it's just like in Malachi 3. Every time God had me read it, I said, why is that angel leaving early? <laughs> he wouldn't tell me. I didn't know until I typed it. I didn't get it. I didn't put these things together. I certainly didn't put Jeremiah into it. Uh, in this new code, I, I read the new code and it just, huh, it just went on. It didn't even mean anything to me. Because I had no background in anything. <laughs> Except for the Ten Commandments and Charlton Heston. It's a great show. But... <laughs> There's been some better Ten Commandments since. I've seen them all. But anyway, Gabriel appears in, I think it's two chapters, and he's described as a man. A man. Gabriel, a man. And it's in a vision. It's not, it's not something where God says in heaven, I have angels, and it's the angel Gabriel, and uh, archangel so-and-so, the fallen angel, Lucifer, um, you, you can't find that in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it came from Christianity. So, so Islam, which didn't begin until the 700s, common era. I think that's the date here. Um, with Muhammad, long after Christianity, which would have been... No, before the Talmud was put together. Judaism, when it really became formal, was with the Talmud, I would suppose, and putting the entirety of the Hebrew, all the scrolls together and canonizing it. <clears throat> and um, it looks like they plagiarized both books. Both books. And like I said, put their own cultural laws, rules, morality, and philosophy into it, but taking the basics. There's, there's Abraham. He's in it. And now, I don't know if Muhammad is supposed to be a descendant of him or not. But here's what happened. So, he, is, uh, he says he's the last messenger, the last prophet of God. That's what's on their mind. It's not the last messenger. It's the last prophet of God. According to the account of Shia Muslims, Muhammad Mustafa, far from being surprised or frightened by the appearance of Gabriel, welcomed him as if he had been expecting him. Gabriel brought the tidings that Allah had chosen him to be the last messenger to mankind and congratulated him on being selected to become the recipient of the greatest of all honors for a mortal in this world from Al-Islam, the birth of Islam and the proclamation by Muhammad of his mission. 
It's in Wikipedia. Muslims believe that the Quran was orally revealed by God to the final prophet, Muhammad, through the Archangel Gabriel, incrementally over a period of some 23 years, beginning in 609 Common Era, when Muhammad was 40 years old. That's an oral tradition. That sounds to me, it, it, that's what the Talmud is. It's the oral tradition written. So it wouldn't be, so it wouldn't be forgotten. The year, uh, and then he died in 632 Common Era. Muslims regard the Quran as Muhammad's most important miracle. He worked miracles like Jesus did. You know, he could bring tidal waves with fish to feed the multitudes. And Jesus said 5,000 with two loaves and five fish, or, five, or two fish and five loaves, something like that. Fed 5,000 people. And um, a, pr a, a proof, his book, the Quran, a proof that he was a prophet, that God spoke to him through Gabriel, the angel. And, the, and that this was, Quran was the culmination of a series of divine messages, starting with those revealed in Adam, of Adam and Eve, and ending with Muhammad. According to tradition, several of Muhammad's companions served as scribes and recorded the revelations. Shortly after his death, the Quran was compiled by the companions who had written down or memorized parts of it. That's from Koran in Wikipedia. God chose his last messenger. And Allah means God, by the way. It's just not the God of the Hebrew Bible and the God of the Jews. God chose the, uh, the last prophet, the last messenger, long before the time of Muhammad. When Malachi wrote Malachi, the messenger, is Elijah for a time to come? And the time still had not come. The land did lay desolate, but they had not returned. It did not bloom again until 1948. And even then, it was a desolation. It took many years to get it going and uh, re renew all the old cities like Jaffa and Haffa and Tel Aviv <clears throat> and uh, of course rebuild Jerusalem you know it's a metropolitan metropolitan area now Elijah which of course is me now how do you think Islam's going to react to me we already know how the Christians are going to react not too favorably not too favorably so this you know, David is here because I'm David. David is here. I am the Moshiach. I am anointed. Which means the man of Isaiah 53 is anointed. And the anointment is the alighting of God's Spirit on me. That's how I know I'm the man of chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Because there is no question that the Spirit and God are within me. And that's how I know this whole concept of God is in the Spirit. And I can point to Scripture that says just that. And explains things where it doesn't say it. Now they believe, they believe Muhammad to be a prophet because of his book. I've got two books that I dictated to me. With all this information, this is this is chapter forty nine of Isaiah for, uh, fifty three in the day of the Lord. See, it's not just about Isaiah fifty three. Now, the last chapter is the day of the Lord, and I'm going to do that probably on a separate video. I may make this uh, another two half-hour recordings. All my camera will take. So, God's righteous servant, me. I am the final prophet, not Muhammad. And as the final prophet, and with the God of the Jews being the being the uh, Abraham uh, and Judaism, being the Abrahamic uh, religion that is correct. There's three. I mean, if you really sit back and think about it, who, who's gonna 
win that? Who's going to win? There's three. Are the Christians going to win it with their human sacrifice? Are the Muslims going to, going to, going to when, I, when clearly it's just a plagiarization? They're going to be a light to the world. Peace and humanity. And they got there by stealing somebody else's book. They took the book of the children of God also. The Christians attached it. At least they didn't attach it to the Koran. You know, I mean, that's a plus in their favor, I suppose. I'm going to go ahead and start into chapter 50. But they, I, I didn't know all that. I didn't know that they were using an angel that doesn't exist. And it doesn't. I've been in, to had an invasion and told and in no uncertain terms that there's no such angels. There's no Michael. There's no Lucifer. There's no fallen angel. It's just part of a story because that's what the people in antiquity and, and today too, to an extent, I just like to believe in that. The, the Christians got so much jumbled up in their minds. So much of the religion conflicts and doesn't make sense. And they've got entire armies of demonic forces that are at war with God, this and that, I promise you. I know his power like the back of my hand. And uh, there, there, you, there's no contending with him. Whatever he thinks he is, he just wills it. Gone, you know. <laughs> he can take this world and turn it into a pea, the size of a pea, just by thinking it. He set off the big bang. That's how Genesis starts out, he divides... Uh, light from dark and this and that. Yeah. We're, we're the dark. That, and the division is the platform of heaven. And we're, we know we're in the dark because he had to put suns in there for us. So there, it's kind of a blend. You have to look. The first, the, the universe, his universe, the unseen realm, and then, and then the real. The, real, the universe of real, which is like, you know, sol uh, objects, solid things, stuff you can see, came with the Big Bang. And uh, it's all within his original unseen realm. So it, we're, we're a universe in a universe. It's not parallel universes, just one inside another. Totally different from each other. Science, totally different. We can never see the unseen realm except what he would place in our minds. I mean, he can place an angel Gabriel in my mind if he wanted to and have me believe it, and I would. But he doesn't. He's, he's very real and matter of fact. Um, and, and, and the fact that this, at this time, people are still believing the things of the people of antiquity who they didn't know anything. They didn't know anything. And they, had, and they, couldn't, back, they couldn't go to the internet and say, well, I'm going to check that out. I don't know about that. <laughs> you know, they couldn't, there's no bookstores, no schools, no teachers. About all you could learn from the wise man was the Hebrew Bible for the Jews. And they spent their life in that book. Well, I had it. I read it for the, sorry, reading it when I was 50. And it's only because God was teaching me that, that I had the knowledge that I do have. Um, it's just not possible that any man could do that. And... I know I could. So, anyway, the day of the Lord. Now, this is interesting because I had kind of forgotten this entire chapter. The term day of the Lord appears in the books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah, and finally, in the last book of the prophets, Malachi. In Ezekiel and Zechariah, the day of the Lord is said to be only against the nations, and then Obadiah against Edom and Esau, Christianity, and the nations. If you see Edom and Esau, it's Christianity. That's, that's just Judaism. If you're going to take their book, take all of them. Take the oral tradition with it, Christians. They're one, they go together. The prophets warn that the day of the Lord is near. But it is not the end of the world. Now, this is true of the Essenes, too, the, uh, the sect of, uh, of Jews who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
But and, and with the same concept, evil's going to be gone, but the good stays. Uh, um, the destiny of the world will be, will be changed. God returns to the earth to dwell among his people in his sanctuary, which he's doing, on his holy mount Zion in Jerusalem, and the world will know that he sanctifies Israel. Lo, the day of the Lord is coming with pitiless fury and wrath to make the earth a desolation, to wipe out the sinners upon it. Isaiah 13 and 9. He said, well, see, that's not, you, you haven't been talking about that day, Lord. It's a half. God's final word on it. Because that's not going to happen. That, 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 again, that's just fun to read. It scares people. In it. Whoa, you know, war's coming kind of a thing. For a day is near, a day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of cloud, an hour of invading nations. A sword shall pierce Egypt. And Nubia shall be seized with trembling when men fall slain in Egypt and her wealth is seized and her foundations are overthrown. Nubia, Put, and Lud. These are, these are names for, the ter for territories that are pre-biblical for the most. They're pre-Abraham. <laughs> the Hebrew. And all the mixed populations and cub and the inhabitants of the allied country shall fall by the sword with them. Ezekiel. Ezekiel has an account of all the tribes returning to the promised land and they go all go individually back to the lots of their ancestor. Their ancestry. Do you know how many <laughs> it is impossible? To determine that. Rambam says, I can do it. I can tell him that, can you? He says, I do it by a spirit and has no concept whatsoever that God is in his spirit. That the spirit that alights upon me is one of being able to determine your ancestry all the way back to the, to the partitioning of the promised land and to the tribe you should belong to that you have the most blood of. Sounds great, Ezekiel. I'm sure people will love it, but uh, not going to happen. Not going to happen today. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that, David's here. The peace in the world. I'm here. You, it's, a, it's just about undeniable. This is like a hundred times more proof than Moses had. You know, it, nobody even knew he was writing the first, the Torah. Nobody, I'm sure nobody knew it. And if they didn't know, they didn't care. And the fact that God was telling them, they may have believed, they may not have. Many of them would, would, would ask him, how do we know you're talking to God? Today, he'd say, well, read this. It's called Leviticus. You think I woke up and wrote God's laws without him telling me what to do? Because I thought that's what he was telling me? That's the Christian. I'm getting a word. I'm getting a word from the word for some reason. They call Jesus the Word before He came into body. <clears throat> so they get a word from the Word. I, I, the Word, I think, means God. I'm not, I'm not sure. But everyone who invokes the name of the Lord shall escape, for there shall be a remnant on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised. Anyone who invokes the Lord will be among the survivors. That's from Job. For I have noted how many of your crimes and how countless your sins, you enemies of the righteous, you takers of bribes, you who subvert, subvert in the gate the cause of the needy. Assuredly, at such a time the prudent man keeps silent, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, and that the Lord, the God of hosts, may truly be with you, as you think, hate evil. So here's some morality in a great story. Day of the Lord. And love good. And establish justice in the gate. Again, the Essenes had gates. People like to hang out at them, as you can imagine. 
and tell stories. <laughs> what else are they going to do? If they had enough food and everything, and be and have all your friends clapping you on the back, great story, great story. Look at all those Gentiles gathering around. Tell that Jesus story. Tell the Jesus story. Then look at them. They get all giddy. And <laughs> throw you some money. Yeah, it could have. Could be like that. And uh, I got a real long, I'm going to skip this one from Zechariah, but, but finishing up with Zephaniah on this uh, um, coming of the end of evil. And I will bring distress upon men that they should walk like blind men because they had been sinned against the Lord and their blood should be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Oh, come on. Okay, you know, let me read a little bit of this one. This is from Zechariah. Now, see, this is like watching a zombie movie. This is like watching a heart show. And we are, you know, most people love to see those every so often, especially as uh, when you're young. As for those people that warred against Jerusalem, the Lord will smite them with this plague. Their flesh shall rot away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall rot in their sockets. And their tongues shall rot away in their mouths. In that day, a great panic from the Lord shall fall upon them, and everyone shall snatch at the hand of another, and everyone raise his hand against everyone else. Jews shall join the fighting in Jerusalem. The same plague shall strike the horses, the mules, the camels, and the asses. The plague shall affect all the animals in those camps. And on and on. Malachi 3 brings a new concept to the day of the Lord. Why is that? Because it's not going to be in antiquity in Jesus' time. It's not going to be in the Middle Ages. It's going to be in the age of the internet, knowledge, science, medicine, common sense, oh, that's right, reasoning, and enlightenment. But it's still fun to read. That's the thing, he was writing for antiquity because this is the kind of stuff they, they not only, they would believe these stories. And, and uh, today, we don't believe them. We just think, wow, that's fun to read. So God was writing it for different areas. He, he wrote for antiquity in the Middle Ages. And then we had the Age of Enlightenment kicking off in about 1600. Computers in 1960. To today, the age of the internet. So, what what new concept in the day of the Lord does Malachi bring? It's God's final word on the day that He is preparing where the new covenant is delivered. And again, He knew they were going to be dispersed, and apparently, He had a pretty good idea when they would be coming back. Okay, this, this, it's the final word of God. Not only on the day of the Lord, but, but the new covenant. What's he saying? What, what, what's really happening? Get away from all these fun stories. He's coming with a covenant of friendship. He says, you're going to be safe from now on. The nations of the world is going to know I sanctified the Jews, that the Jews were correct about the Abrahamic religions. I'm going to build a temple which shows I have sanctified you because nobody's going to want you to build it. You know, uh, the Gentiles of the northern kingdom, imported by Assyria, didn't want the second temple built. They, they, they obstructed the building of it and tried to stop it completely with letters to Cyrus <clears throat> or to whoever was leading Persia in that, at, at the time they sent the letters. Um, and he says, uh, New Covenant, everybody's going to be sin free, holy seed, holy seed, and since he did the same thing, with the uh, exiles, he never says, I'm making you a holy seed to build the temple. He never does say that. But that is what happened. And it's going to happen again. He's going to have that temple built, I don't know, 10, 20 years from now. I, I don't know. Presumably before I die. But now David, he died before, before the building of the first temple. Although he had a lot to do with gathering all the materials for it and the wealth that went into it. 
<clears throat> and and Solomon had a had a home to be honored. There's always a lot of things happening again that are real. As a matter of fact, it took longer to build Solomon's house than the temple. So he must have had a pretty honorable abode, right? <laughs> that and God talked to him. Um, now, God doesn't address the nations. As I started out these different days of the Lord's in the various books, some are just pointed at Christianity, some is the nations. Uh, you know, they kind of differ. But Malachi 3 is real clear. It's the Jewish people, the people of the land of Israel, as much as anything. Um, that's the focus. When I come back, you know, the sanctuary to be placed amongst his people in Jerusalem. Although the covenant, uh, the friendship covenant does not say in Jerusalem. I think that's pretty much implied. Although as David, see David purchased the temple not for God after he had failed the test that God put him to as kind of a uh, making up for it. I, I, I've always said this land. And uh, I could go by. There's people who have raised millions of dollars for the building of the third temple out there right now. Just on the belief it will happen. God will come. They just don't know how because of the false teachings. Teaching of antiquity. The teaching teachings for people of antiquity. Well, the people today aren't of antiquity. Compared to those people, they are all brilliant geniuses. Every single person who has a computer is a brilliant genius. Knowledgeable. <laughs> Over these people. So, here's God. Not only is he saying something different than your traditional day of the Lord, he's saying in future times, in the times where man is more enlightened, knowledgeable, we're just going to build sanctuary and everybody's going to be safe because it, that that's just going to keep people from picking on you as much as they are and they'll have it in their minds. Just don't mess with them. That God could be in there. <laughs> God might be there after all. Keep the keep the Middle East at bay. And of course, you know, when I die, that's not to say God's not going to continue on them as he did with Solomon, with, uh, with Elijah, Elijah. Uh, that was followed up by Elisha. Uh, the Davidic dynasty was supposed to continue the line of David, but I don't believe there's anything that, well, his covenant does. Well, my son's a great guy, and God says, you really want, would you want me to put him through that, what you've been through? And I thought, of, <laughs> I said, yeah, that'd be good for him. <laughs> I mean, I really wouldn't wish, I wouldn't wish that pain on anybody, but it changes to so much for the good. And you know, you can't really feel another person's pain. I know that pain. I still live in it. You can't imagine what happened to me just two months ago. Oh, I can't, I'm not allowed to tell you, and I wouldn't tell you. But um, it was brutal. I, I, it, it, went to, it went from... I have my top five things that he's done to me, and it moved up to, it, it went by everybody to number one. It made number one. I hope that's the culmination of those events. So anyway, lasted about three months. So back to, the, uh, back to this. So he doesn't address the, the nations, but only Israel and its people, which is all Jews of the world. Everybody in the world is forgiven. Doesn't mean you go to heaven, got to be in right standing. Um, and hopefully this is going to be, you know, there's, all the Jews aren't coming back to, to the promise and to Israel. But I think my presence, and particularly if you build the temple, and then consider this. The nation, if you think the Christians are friendly to you today, you're not going to be saying that two or three years from now. Not when you can put in their face. We told you we were right. Because that's what they're always telling you. You, you know, you know how to read your own Bible. That's Jesus. That's 53 is Jesus. And you've got all the arguments that I'm putting before you. By the way, this Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, every single one of the 50 chapters is summarized in a paragraph, a few of them two paragraphs. 
as an addendum. If nothing else, you stop it. It's like six pages. I don't know how many pages. It might be more than that. Um, <laughs> okay, it might be a lot more than that. But anyway, um, if you're in a bookstore, just flip to the back, read the addendum, and just see all the different things that are addressed that, that really aren't Isaiah 53. The first 20 chapters are kind of like you need to have this knowledge. You need to know about angels and God and his angel. And uh, a lot of I've kind of broached, but to moving on. God says, of course, you've heard this. Behold, I'm sending my messengers to clear the way before me to build the temple. And the Lord whom you seek shall come to his temple suddenly. The messenger is Elijah in verse 23. As for the angel of the covenant that you desire, he's already coming. I've talked about that. The angel of his presence brings the new covenant, Jeremiah 31. All Jews are forgiven of their sins and iniquities. And it's going to be when I get my books published. That's when it becomes official from God's line. And even then, it has to be people who, who find out about it. Once you find out, whether you believe it or not, but when you start hearing your sin free, that's when you need to avoid the evil inclination and really, really stress your Judaism and learning your Torah, which is the effect God expects Torah on your hearts. And he, God, revere and esteem his name. Because you don't want to miss what he's preparing uh, and, and you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss watching the evolution of the Jewish people from Abraham. He's going to pick, you know, God's name will probably be, you know, Poindexter or something. Who knows? He's, he's so funny. But uh, I'm sure, okay, it'll be serious, God says. He says, we could, I let Keith cut up a lot. And he's a human being. It's, it's good for him. And I, I play along some. But he'll tell you, it's, it's, it's not nearly enough, or, or it's too long, or it's not long enough. God recognizes that the forgiveness and equities and sins of Jewish people will not cause all to heed him. And in Malachi, he says, it, I know there are those that don't, those that do, I'm putting in the scroll of remembrance. In Christianity, believing in Jesus and accepting him as his one Lord and Savior brings sin forgiveness and entry to heaven when he returns. You know, I've covered that. Even if you've committed murder and other crimes against humanity and God, and that's just not true uh, with the God of Israel. He's not going to have bad people up there. But that doesn't mean you don't want to practice Judaism. Because I know the Jewish people would like to focus on life today. That this, the, the, the heaven that the Christians dream of and think of uh, is not first and foremost for the Jew. It's being a light. It's living life as well as it can with all these instructions God gave us on how to do it. And so this is, this is bonus time. And God knew that. You just have to understand, he's able to play these things out in his mind as though he sees the world, the evolution of generations and cities being built and things being invented and knowledge and universities coming in. And he can just watch it all happen. And he can see what's going to happen to the Jews. He knows they're going to get destroyed in Europe. And he'll tell you, Okay, I'm not supposed to go into that. <clears throat> Maybe someday. But um, but moving forward here, I just keep that in mind. He knows it's going to be a modern time. And here I am, and listen to what he's having me tell the rabbis. And you know what, you, if, you know what the effect of that is? You know, it's not a metaphor like Torah on your heart. But, you know, he says he forgives sin, that makes everybody learn Torah. You know, it's really two separate different things. But, uh, so anyway, God knew in modern times of secularism and reliance on science, medicine, and technology that his righteous servant might not be recognized. 
The utter destruction is simply on its way, just like it was with the Assyrians, Babylonians, and the Romans long ago. There's no mention in Malachi 3 of the destruction of the nations as it is in, in some of the, uh, the books and chapters and verses that I, was, that I just read at the beginning of this video, uh, or at least on the day of the Lord. It, it is implied there will be in this destruction in the land of Israel because God says, if he doesn't do it, when I come, it will be with utter destruction as though there's going to be some and there would be to take the temple now. Did it have to be something like the Sixth Day War? I don't think I don't think Israel would ever just storm it and say, "Well, that's it. We're just tired of it. It's gotta go." And unless there's some heinous act done, like a like a nuclear suitcase bomb, where they finally say, "That's it. Only Jews in this land, and we don't care what it takes." That's what they did to us. They just threw us out, took everything we own, took our bank accounts, took our houses, took everything. Just said, "Go." We had to walk to the promised land. But it's the building of the third temple. Now, oh, but I, I remember that. <clears throat> it's the building of the third temple. That's, that, that's what's so important. Defeating the enemies of the nations that come against Israel and the sanctification of Israel is the land and people blessed by God with his presence in his sanctuary is how utter destruction is avoided in the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. So it's the exact opposite. He's not coming to destroy evil. He's coming to safeguard the Jewish people so we don't see a holocaust again. He's Basically, that's what he's telling you. If the land were destroyed today by nuclear bombs from Iran, 10,000 missiles launched at the same time from Lebanon, and don't care, you know, the sling of David, their protective system to bring down rockets is never going to be able to stop that. And you got 7 million Jews there. And we lost 6 million in the Holocaust. And that's such a brutal thing and brutal time. I still have a hard time understanding how we've already advanced so far, as awful as things are even today, from that. Well, people could, you know, the Nazis, they, they, they singled out children. That was their favorite kill. It, 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 <laughs> they were running low on bullets. Instead of shooting the kid or gas and gassing them, they throw them in those kilns alive. So, you know... That's just, uh, uh, but and it's a people. It's not some madman. It's not. It's not Dahmer. It's you know. It's not. It's not just one crazy person out there. It was an entire country, and, and maybe it wasn't just there. Russia was doing the same thing. They were hauling them out of their houses, making them dig ditches, and just going down. Family members, father, son, kids, or kids first. Boom, throw them in there. Whole blocks, whole neighborhoods. I, no, I don't want, some of the visions he's given me I, to make me really feel and understand what, what what would it be like for the Gestapo just to just break down your door and you're sitting with your family at dinner and you have no clue what, who they even are and all of a sudden everybody's being murdered and, 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 and your girl's raped first and your wife I mean and he put me into it's you know we can think about it and be horrified but he can make it so real, it's as though you're there, but it's still different once you come out of the vision. It's a lot different. One, you're not scarred by it. <laughs> but, uh, I have a lot, a lot of things I'm just, that's just about it for the day of the Lord that I have. You know, this, this man and divine being, host of the Lord's host, you know, it's one God. He stays the oneness of God. Uh, of Israel, one angel, and it's the angel of his presence, who doesn't have an angelic body. 
and he's in and one man, the Moshe, the anointed one. And the anointment is the spirit of lighting and answering you. That's the anointment. There's, there's no oil as in our world of, of the, I call it the real, and God's uh, world, the unseen realm, which is a universe inside a universe. And he's responsible for this one. You know, uh, he made a division of the heavenly bright white light you can't even see in it. That he he, he kind of shows me in visions uh, when we're uh, we're dealing with David in the temple. It's not the same temple that's that's on the ground here. It's different, but still the temple still got the walls. Around. There's a lot of similarities, but. Um, in one vast room, it's that bright white light, and in the other is the king's throne and water coming out, flowing down the steps out front. And uh, so here he is in a future time. See, a time is coming in the future, in the year. It is in the year 2020, or or anything like that. But but again, he knew. He knew exactly what was going to do. He needed to come to me in 1957 or select me when when the first satellite was launched into the air by Russia, Sputnik. And he said that's when he touched my arm and disfigured me. He really won't. You know, you say, well, how, how can you not, not trust him or not believe him or this or that? Because I'm in the fire refinement. Lying to me is just part of it. And he finds it so humorous <laughs> to make me think I'm coming out of this thing. And I thought it, I thought it 11 years ago. I thought we were done with all the pain and shenanigans and <laughs> adventures with uh, with with Christian. He said, "Christian knows you're here." I said, "No, who's here? <laughs> you, you, you're the man J Jesus claimed to be. Isn't that funny, Jesus?" Jesus says in the New Testament to, to his people, to his twelve at least, do not listen to those who come in my name. It's kind of funny because if he comes, he says, I'm Jesus, then I'm supposed to listen to him. But uh, the fact is, he came in my name. He came as the teacher of righteousness. He came as the man of Isaiah 53. He came in my name, and that's given me all kinds of trouble to get this thing going, to do what I have to do for God to keep utter destruction from Israel and to save the Jewish people. I've got these Christians who believe in human sacrifice. I've got these rabbis who believe a man of a hundred years is suddenly going to be thought a child and every single human being, every Chinese, every Korean, every Eskimo, every one suddenly are going to go, huh, the Jews have been right all along. We need to exalt them. Let's take our stuff and give it to them and till their land for them. And, and look, there's no pain anymore. Huh, it's like I died. The Messianic ears of heaven on earth. That's what they take what he believed in in the resurrection. So I got to deal with that. They, aren't they supposed to be protectors of the Jewish people? Follow God's laws. Have better lives, morality. Look at you know you don't just go hurt people. You don't you don't keep people from doing what they need to get done with lies and false teachings. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I fell into the rabbis again. I call it a lie when you say the Jewish people gathered as one were were stricken and plagued with disease as one, and as one offered themselves for guilt to God passing the test of devotion, and that they then went out and had long lives, all saw their children, and they made the rest of the world righteous. Well, let's see you do it, Israel. Huh? Hey, rabbis, Tobias Singer, Michael Scoban, all you people who preach Israel as the man, the Jewish people, described in Isaiah 53, I want to see you, since you want me to go build a temple as David, you want me to bring peace between the nations and throughout the earth, you want me to end pain in the individual, you want me to teach billions of Chinese how to speak Hebrew, 
That's what you want me to do. I want to see you make the world righteous. I'm the righteous servant, and I dedicate it, and I pass it to you. Now you like that. I'm not going to let you stop me, and guess what? I got somebody behind me that you don't want to contest or contend with. Because people throughout this land are going to hear this very speech about you and Jews for Judaism and Outreach Judaism, your 900-page book, which I shudder to even think about opening personally because of your midrash on Isaiah 53, which you had posted on your Facebook notes, and I was one of your friends, and you said in it, share this with everybody. You gave me... You gave me the right to use it as long as I don't slander you, perjure you, and guess what? God had me type in Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, which will become a bestseller someday. A big part of your midrash on the human sacrifice of the blemish rams by Hitler which shows that Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people. Six million of them. Well, that's all I have on my day of the Lord and uh, doing my job of bringing the wrath and bringing the reckoning. I'm the righteous servant. I'm David. I'm Elijah. I'm the prophet like Moses. And soon to be published, a song, a new song God had me write. And I'm an eternal priest of the order of Metelsedic and King David and a rightful king that would be leader. It's the same song David used. It's scripture. When David wrote it, God told him, David, write this down. A psalm of David. My Lord said to his Lord. And there we go again with Christians. They say that if it's the Lord and he's talking to the Lord, that's God of the Trinity talking to Jesus. What's the problem? One, one of them's capitalized and one's not. What was the other big, big, big reason? Well, just read it. It's a song about him. It's written by somebody who works for King David, a, a servant, uh, uh, something in the kingdom. He's writing of him when you read it because he would be Lord to this man. He's a lowly servant. Yes, Lord. You know, he's a king. That's what you say. It's not Jesus. It's not meant to be Jesus. It's not a, what do they call it? Epitome of Jesus? I don't know what it is. God wrote stories that have meaning that's, that's just not right there until you know the story of Jesus. I got to end with this since I apparently still got a little camera time. So, nothing is ever written about Jesus. Okay, nothing in Dead Sea Scrolls, nothing by them, uh, no commotion at the gate, as in gate with Jesus saying that, you know, you can't say you're a righteous servant because our founder is a righteous servant. And uh, yeah, no altercations noted in the New Testament. And there would have been, God tells me, a pretty contentious group out there. Not a lot of law abiders. But uh, I said, I know, I had to deal with them. I think I was tough on them. should have tried to deal with them. So, until, until 70, what happened in 70, the first big Jewish revolt, 500,000 Jews defeated, battle after battle. People don't think the Jews fight. They fought for every inch of Jerusalem they could get. And then there was another revolt, and then another revolt. And they finally, <laughs> it's like being in God's fire refinement. They were in the Roman fire refinement. They said, okay. I said, let's get out of here. Thanks for the land, God. We got to go. You made everybody mad at us. We're saying we're the chosen. Well, well. So, that's when the first book, uh, you know, so you see these two rabbis, you know, trudging along through Syria and heading towards Europe. And, what are we going to do for money? What are we going to do? I've got kids, everything. I can't go to the synagogue and make money. That's, that's, that's how I make my living. It's teaching the Hebrew Bible. His friend says, his friend says it's Shlomo. 
that story about the Jesus. It, I get money every time I tell that story, especially if I change it up a little bit. Every time I tell that story, boom, you know, I got lunch, I got dinner. I sometimes have food for the, ne the next day. They love it. You change out, they just get all. I believe, praise Jesus, fall on the ground. Holy rollers. That's where the first holy rollers came from. If you don't know what that is, look it up. He says, you got it. They love this stuff. And slow mo looked at him and said, oh, you got to be kidding me. You can't put that story in the Hebrew Bible. You can't connect Moshe to that. He comes in, rides the ass in Jerusalem and defeats Rome and becomes king of the world. What are you talking about? We'll just change it. <laughs> Maybe it was the writers who were deceitful. The hit would only be because there was no Jesus. Nothing written about him. Are you kidding me? Man's walking on water, feeling, feeding everybody. The blind see, the crippled walk, dead or risen. You think he'd have been? He'd have probably taken. Uh, he'd have taken the uh, the Roman leader's position from him. That's what he would have done, and just made him leave. He'd used his head instead of trying to fight him. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. I guarantee you, the revolts would have had more success, although ultimately beaten down just by numbers. If God and me had been there with with this unit, <laughs> this human body, or any other human body, just because He knows everything, He said. <laughs> It'd be more like the Americans fighting the British, hiding in trees and bushes and stuff. <laughs> so anyway, uh, thank you. Uh, tell anybody who's interested in Isaiah 53 that there's a, a new take on it. There's new explanations. And uh, tell them it's the leper scholar. That's from the the town, Babylonian town. And there's a, actually, it's quoted something, Sanhedrin 9b. I'm not sure if that's in the Talmud or it just gets spoken of in the Talmud. I know the Sanhedrin, I know what they are. Um, but I don't recall seeing anything that in the Talmud, Sanhedrin is like a, a special book or something or some extra or a section. I, I don't recall ever seeing that. And, and again, this is where, you know, God, uh, you know, I'm still a human. I'm still Keith. And the way he does that is I still, you know, I still can't find my car keys, <laughs> if I had a car. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm the same old forgetful person. He keeps me forgetful. But I'm still a lot better than I was. Um, anyway, it was easier using my computer, but um, I don't know what it looks like on the video with me looking down so much. And so much today I was reading and not... Uh, you know, like Isaiah 53, it's on the tip of my tongue anytime. But um, I hadn't looked at these two in a couple.